Hey, hey, YouTube. <laughs> We're back. Hoy, hoy. We're back for another special Halloween episode. So we've, uh, as you can see, we've traveled out to the graveyard tonight, Friday night, midnight. What better place to show scary books than a Halloween than at a nice old graveyard. Spooky. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so tonight we've got some very special books for you. Stuff you don't see a whole lot of. Stuff that uh, you're only going to see at the Halloween season. Jose, Mike, and me, we both really uh, scored some great books at the last Toronto Comic Book Show. A lot of horror books, um, even some Golden Age goodies. So tonight we're going to have an extra special night. And I think you're really going to like what you see. It's very different than what we normally show. Yeah. Heading lead off here, we've got special guest Mike. And he's got a new and an old vintage segment. In other words, we have a brand new book from this year. And we have a Bronze Age vintage book. Take it away, Mike. Oh, yeah. I mean, when it comes to horror, it's all about cover appeal. You got it. I picked this up in March from Retro Rare. Wow, Sandy put that book in your hands. I can see why. Man, quality there. I don't know the artist, but it's got me hooked. There's some real good cover appeal. Again, an image that's been done before, but again, you look at the quality of the penciling, the shadows, everything, very evocative cover. And let's face it, it's horror books. And mm -hmm. if the cover doesn't pull in, and it's it's not made a it's not made uh, an impression. You don't probably want to go into it. I love the yeah. way the uh, demon seems to be emerging from the crypt. Those lower things they almost look like skeletons, but they don't look human at the same time. Yeah, it's a wow. very very uh, atmospheric cover. Not to mention monsters are coming to Marvel. Oh, yeah. yeah. What do you got under there, Mike? Underneath. Okay, vintage time. Oh, something we don't see every day. A Charlton book. Yes, Midnight Tales, volume one, number one. Midnight Tales, this series only lasts until about 76. This is the first appearance of what it says so right there on the cover there. Yeah. Midnight Philosopher and Arachne. Yeah, first great issue. Another number one, 20 cent issue. I remember this book. I picked it up at Toronto Comic Book Show. The only book I've ever bought that when I opened, it was so stinky. My God, I thought a skunk had be bit by it. I mean, <laughs> I, I ended up having to get rid of it. Uh, I've had an eye watering. Yeah, it was scary. It wasn't, yeah, scary. Anyway, cover, Wayne Howard on this one. Really good cover. VG plus 4.5, I would say. Yeah. Lower mid grade, that's for sure. But yeah. a number one issue. Yeah, but it's uh, got a lot of things that could be pressed out and made to look a heck of a lot better, and it would improve it in grade. Um, yeah, but it's got one large diagonal uh, color crease break on the lower right corner. But otherwise, a lot of that stuff can be pressed out, and it's got good eye appeal for lower grade, and that's what you want. Your number one issue, you can't go wrong there. In Charlton, it's nice because we don't get to show them that often, do we? They're the Rodney Dangerfield. They get no respect. You pick this up for less than what a new book would cost. Enough said. Mm. Great way to start the episode, Mike. Great pickups. Thanks for bringing them in. Tasty bargain books. And next up, we've got uh, Jose. And he's got a book that I do not recognize. I don't recognize it at all. But it's really interesting, Mike. I'm sorry, Jose. That's really interesting. Yeah, for my first salvo, I have some esoteric picks here, just to change it up a thing. Okay, so we'll start off with Red Circle Sorcery, issue number six, from April of 1974, from Archie Comics. Now, when you think of Archie Comics, uh, it's safe to say, horror isn't exactly the first thing that comes to mind. No. <laughs> but believe it or not, Archie Publications tried to change all of that in the early 70s, under the imprint moniker of Red Circle Comics Group. They began the chilling adventures of sorcery starring Sabrina the Witch in 72, and then, five issues later, the series got a drastic overhaul and became Red Circle Sorcery. 
Yeah, Red Circle Sorcery issue number six. The anthology contains a total of seven stories written and drawn by some of the best talents in the industry. I'll feature some of the stories briefly here. The first story, Warrior's Dream, as well as this eerie and atmospheric cover are exquisitely drawn by Gray Morrow of Tarzan and Buck Rogers fame and tells the tale of a warrior haunted by the ghost of his lover. Next up is Out of Practice, which is surprisingly written by none other than Phil Suling, best known as the founder of the direct market distribution system, which was responsible for getting comics around the newspaper and magazine loophole and directly into comic shop themselves. The two-page story tells the tale of a sick doctor and his request to have another doctor watch over his patients. A request, of course, goes horribly wrong. Death goes, on to, go, death goes to a sales convention is the story of what happens to a salesman who makes a very bad decision. And then we have The Patience of a Cat which was written by Phil Suling's wife, Carol, and beautifully drawn by Howard Chaikin, the creator of American Flag. Now, this is probably the best story in the book and tells the tale of a witch named Lynette who turns a would-be lover into a cat to teach him a lesson. Of course, we end up with Face of Love, Face of Death, which is my favorite story in the comic book. Now, it's the tale of a lover boy style, style DJ shown here on the cover, meeting a female fan over the phone who is just dying to meet him. Now, I'd say this issue of Red Circle Sorcery is very good. And although most of the stories are lacking in gore and not really very scary, if you're being completely honest, we have to remember, this is from the Archie Comics clan and they sure could have done much worse in my opinion. Now, although the series ended after only a few more issues, we're left with some great artwork and a glimpse of what could have been in the world of Archie Horror before Riverdale came out. Very nice, yeah. Yes, the 49th Overstreet price breaks for this book are nine, 13, and $16 in the eight, nine, and 9.2 great splits. Pick up from the local, the big P, Pendragon there. 20 bucks Canadian, it's like 15 US. It's a solid higher grade copy, I'd say it's safe 885, something along those lines. For 20 bucks, I'd buy it for the cover alone if the pages were blank inside and it's got some really good stories in there. That's for sure after like the Archie was a great series. Yes. Now, next up, next up we have Elvira's House of Mystery. Issue number 11, last issue from January of 1987. This is the giant sized Halloween Spectacular. In 86 and 87, DC Comics published a new anthology series, Elvira's House of Mystery. It will last 11 issues plus a special. This series was a quasi follow up to the original series with famed horror movie hostess Elvira temporarily taking over the job as caretaker of the House of Mystery, introducing horror stories similar to the original series. Now, it seems that speculators have quote-unquote discovered the work of the late, great Dave Stevens. Well, all I can say is congratulations to them. <laughs> For the normal comic collecting crowd like myself, we've always appreciated Stevens' work, and there are lots of great covers at still very affordable prices to choose from but i'm of the opinion that this book is a hard to find in great condition because of the all black cover and b among one of his best works period and collectors have caught on too no cheap day stevens bull from a bin here i snagged this from a dealer at the last Toronto comic book show in late september I think any male local comic book shop owner who sees this book coming in will instinctively price it up. The good news is that you're not going to have to pay a fortune for it yet. But like Planet Comics Good Girl covers, I suspect it's only going to follow a steady upward trajectory and price going forward. 49th Overstreet price breaks for this bad girl are $13, $18, and $22 US only in the 8, 9, and 9.2 grade splits. I stepped up. 
I paid, I'd figure at least, you know, a couple of times guide, maybe two and a half times guide for, you know, for grade. I think it's a nice solid cover, maybe a 992, but 60 bucks Canadian, which is something around 45 US, is paying up for this book. But mm -hmm. having said that, do I have a single regret? Hell no. No, that's for sure. Beautiful cover. Number one issue. Oh, is it, no, sorry, number number eleven yes, issue. Yes, this is the Halloween Al special. Alvira, right across the front cover. Can't go wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last book briefly. This is Vampirella versus Lady Death. The end. Issue number one from two thousand. Yeah, this is the Metal Text Edition variant by Dorian Clevenger. Now, as a bonus, I'm including this great painted, what I call cat fight cover, published by Harris Comics as a one shot back in the millennium year of 2000. I'll be upfront and say I'm no big variant collector by any means, but I managed to bundle this book with the Elvira issue from the same dealer at the Toronto Comic Book Show for $120 Canadian or $60 each. So. I guess what I'm saying is I managed to save 15 bucks off from this issue. It's a relatively scarce, hard to find variant. Um, and Lady Death fans are kind of loyal and they look for all these variants. I think there's only, when I looked recently, three listings on the entire eBay at the moment, all auction ones with one with a buy it now option. And that's ending in a few days from the date we shoot these. Prices were asked from between $60 and $130 roughly without shipping charges. My take, because the sales history of something like this is very sporadic, that fair market value for a book like this is between $50 and $100 Canadian, which is somewhat of a widespread, but I think it's kind of like a spotty thing that you have to find the right buyer for it to get like top dollar. But having said that, paid $60, bucks, $10 over my usual cutoff limit. I'm glad I'm at the lower end of the spectrum. Still a nice, nice foil variant cover. I'm a Lady Death fan, so I was able to pick this up at a reasonable price. I have no regrets. Yeah, it's it's Scary tough when you're buying a newer book for 75 bucks, Jose, but I gotta be honest, that's one of the nicest looking foil covers I've ever seen. So uh, I personally don't have a problem with it, that kind of money for and a it's book. It's almost 20 years old. Yeah, it, but yeah. It's a well to me that's a new book. Yeah, it is a new book and people would still consider a new book. I guess we just should not underestimate the loyalty of Lady Death fans and Vampirella fans. True. So it has a double kind of appeal factor for it. But I'm all I'm saying is I would not step up big time for a book like this. There's no way I would pay a hundred dollars for it. Oh for sure, for sure. Those are great uh, acquisitions, Jose. What a great way to start the episode. Thanks for bringing those in. Good girls, bad girls. Scary, but I can't look away. Okay, so I'm next. I'm next up. Now, um, these I'm showing two books here, and both of these were purchased at the uh, the last Toronto Comic Book Show, the one that was at the end of September there that we all attended. Now, as 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 I as I indicated in the last episode, I've been kind of slumming it lately. Expenses have been racking up, so you know I'm, I'm really don't have as much money as I as I normally have. So what I've been trying basically concentrating on is trying to find some pretty good deals, some really nice covers, uh, books in the 60s or 70s at bargain basement prices. So this first book is is a nice creepy looking cover. You can see the mummy coming down. Um, attacking the crowd there. This is a nice gold key. This is uh, the Occult Files of Dr. Spectre. And I picked this up at uh, Hagenland in their $5 bin, if you can believe it. <clears throat> now, obviously there's nothing particularly special about this book. Gold key doesn't get a lot of love in the community, but it's a very nice, uh, well, I'm not going to say a high grade. I'm going to say more of a mid grade uh, from October 1974. So, so the book is getting up there. And I just like it purely for cover peer, peel. It's got that really nice painted cover. I mean, I just I just love the way Gold Key presented these books at the time. And yeah, I'm very happy with it. 
The one thing I would say about Golki that always messes with my head is their numbering, man. Mm -hmm. They got some arcane mixed up, like weird, difficult, like you can't tell by opening up. This is actually issue number ten. You can't, but it, yeah, it, yeah. you can't tell. Yeah, no, yeah, I know. Until you open. Yeah, yeah, but it's a cool painted cover, and well, you know what? You know, it wouldn't be you know October and Halloween without you showing some gold key painted covers, yeah, man. Sure. I am not disappointed by this pickup, and I will say it is a very appealing cover. Yeah, and thumbs uh, up from me. In other words, yeah. Yeah, and and like I said, it doesn't get a lot of, doesn't going to cost you a lot of money. You don't get a lot of love in the comic book community. So uh, just from the comic book realm, in the 9.4, 9, 8, and 6.0 grades, you're looking at 28, a 26, 24, and 11 dollars. So again, it's comic book realm, so you got to take it with a grain of salt. But I like it, and it didn't cost me next to nothing. What do you got? Okay, bring what I got. I got in there. Okay, again, Grimm's Ghost Stories. This is a real nice one from November 1977. It's Grimm's Ghost Stories number 42. Again, just uh, looking for creepy kind of uh, covers for the Halloween season. Again, really not a whole lot to this book. Not going to cost you a lot of money. Um, again, from the comic book realm, even in the high grade, this only lists for about 10 bucks. Um, I'll go through a couple of the grades here, 9.4, 9, 8, and 7. You're looking at 10, 9.50, 8.50, and $5. So, again, just something in the... I, it did pay 10 bucks because this is a very, very high grade. I'm even going to go so far to say it's between a 9.4 and a 9.6. It really is a pristine copy I picked up here. So I don't mind paying 10 bucks for it. I will say, man, that must be one hard-up ghost pirate to be plundering a masquerade party. <laughs> for his final booty, I guess what, he's trying to save up for his retirement? <laughs> it looks but like it. That's, I mean, what a tagline. <laughs> anyway, pages, pages. Anyways, those are my first two cheapy cheapies. I hope you like them. Ah, good pickups, good covers. Okay, so next up we got Jose, and he's got a very, or I guess this would be sort of considered a new book, but a very nice new Hellraiser book, Jose. That's fantastic. Yeah, I guess if you can 30, 30 years old to be new, I, I guess do. in a way, everything <laughs> being relative, of course this is Hellblazer, number one from January 1988. Key book, yeah, it's got the first appearance of Papa Midnight, the first appearance of Chas Chandler, First Nemnoth, first appearance of Emma as a spirit, and the first appearance of Gary Lester. Nice. Yeah. With all the rumors about our boy Kenal Reeves joining the Marvel Cinematic Universe, why not give the 2005 movie Constantine a rewatch? I think it's been much unfairly maligned. I think people doth protest too much. I could never really figure out what people held against that movie. I've recently rewatched it, and I think in this life, everything and everybody should get a second chance. It had really good visuals, a good story, or a decent enough story, basically a rehashing of a different type of origin, and it had a very good cast. Besides Kano, we had Rachel Weiss and Tilda Swinton, both Academy Award winners. So, in that light, Let's revisit the prospects of Hellblazer issue number one, in which our anti-hero leads his first self-styled book. John leaves the swamp behind as he journeys to solve supernatural threats around the world. Now, this book, as well as his first appearance in Swamp Thing issue number 37 from June of 1985, experienced a dramatic decline in sales prices in late 2004 and throughout 2015. 2014 and 15 were very bad years. Now, this negative sentiment, of course, can be primarily attributed to the cancellation of the live-action TV series at the time. Interestingly, since then, the first appearance of John Constantine in Swamp Thing 37 has been on quite a bit of an upwards tear, as well as all other first issues. They're basically a rising tide floats all boats. Mm -hmm. Over the last two years, that issue sale prices have almost doubled. Now, let's take our look at our, our issue here, on the, on the other hand, has basically flatlined. Yeah, it's got some low volume of sales, and I guess this makes the book a poor investment Investment at this point. Now, of course, needless to say, 
the market is soft on the book at the moment which creates a buying opportunity as far as I'm concerned to snag a quality high grade copy for cheap. CTC 9.8 copies which comprise the top 19% of the census are dropping for on average $170 US. But even better bargains are at the CTC 9.6 graded copies. They're selling for only $75 US on average. eBay is the logical place to go to snag a copy or look at a con which is where I snagged my copy at last year's December con. I dicker and bargain hard with the dealer. I told them, look, basically fair market is about 60 US, which is recently with currency exchange rates, 80 bucks. I told them, I know I'm asking for 20% off of $100 Canadian, but I told them this is dead money. I'm buying a book that's really cold right now. I mean, he went for it. He said, okay, I'll take 80 bucks. So I paid $80 Canadian. Yeah, so my advice, if you're buying a raw copy like I did, just make sure you snag, that, snag one that is very crisp and clean with lots of color gloss and a good register. Do not settle. Look for at least near mint copies and be prepared to haggle. Yeah, the 49th Overstreet price breaks for this book are $27, $44, and $60 US in the 8, 9, and 9.2 grade splits. A nice, tight, at least near mint copy, if not near mint plus. That's what I find funny about this book. It's why I've always said, never throw any book out, no matter how worthless, because this book used to be, you could used to be able to pick this up 10 years ago in the $5 bin. I actually have this book stuck under, I have like five, 600 comics underneath my bed. It's where I keep all my worthless books. And to tell you the truth, until you just showed this now, I thought it was worthless. This one's stuck under my bed somewhere. <laughs> it's oh, not even in a box. It's time to come up from under the bed, buddy. Put it in a box. <laughs> That's for sure. And, board it. and while Jose's on his topic of Constantine, I mean, I, I saw that movie. Jose, you like it? I got to be honest. It's not that I don't like it, but I just find it... Um, very mediocre like a very mediocre book so i mean uh, sorry mediocre movie so i was not really a big fan of it i gotta be honest but i'll take it that that's your movie yeah yeah i think it needs a second appraisal a second chance and i just do not want i i, I, I and no one has explained to my satisfaction what people found so objectable i mean mm -hmm. i know the story was not great but it wasn't bad and i'd like i said I, I fall back on the visuals which were great and the acting mm -hmm. and the choice as far as the people that were cast in the roles i thought it was well done i mean what yeah, can yeah. i say no, you're entitled I've seen part of it, yeah so I can't yeah, well, he'll say his entitled his opinion, even if his opinion is wrong. But while, that, while we're on that topic and uh, we're talking about scary movies, we do it each year. We each pick um, one scary movie that we, that we either like or, or that we recommend that we maybe haven't seen in a long time. Jose is obviously picking Constantine here. And I guess I can sort of understand there are certain qualities of the movie that are, that are, are different, I guess, something new. Me, I'm going to pick something that, uh, again, I'm going to go a little bit more obscure here. Um, not going to pick one of their classics, but uh, a little while ago I bought um, uh, the Universal. I bought one of those Universal um, Midnight Marathon packs where you get four hor horror movies. There's quite a few of these packs out there that feature some of the more prominent films uh, from Universal during the 70s, 80s, 90s. And this Marathon pack I picked up had uh, Psycho 2 in it. Aries go, ah, yeah, yeah, okay, Cycle 2. We all know that Cycle 1 is the classic. Everybody loves Cycle 1. It's not just a cult classic. It is a horror classic. However... It's just a classic yeah. movie, period. And it's a movie that you not you would not think would lend itself to a sequel, if you know what I'm saying. No, but this one did. Uh, cycle 2... Uh, actually, they made they made four more: Cycle Two, Three, Four, and then another one called wow. Bates Motel. I never re well, yeah, I saw Bates Motel, which was well done, which is basically him as a teenager with his good old mom. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that many sequels, really? Wow, yeah. oh man. So, anyways, back to what I was saying. My recommendation this year, and I just watched it the other night, is Psycho Two, and it basically follows the story of Norman Bates after he's released from prison. Well, not really. He was never really in prison. He was put into the psycho ward. He was in the loony bin. Yeah, the loony bin, and he was uh, deemed by his doctors to be cured, 
And so he follows his stories. He goes back to his home to reopen the Bates Motel. And the story progresses from there. And, you know, he's mad as a hatter. So once he gets home, things start to happen. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think we can let our imaginations know where that movie's yeah. going to lead. But but I enjoyed the movie. Obviously, it it, it, it it stars Anthony Perkin, but it also stars one of the most beautiful actresses of the 80s, I think, Meg Tilly. And, uh, I mean, she did a spectacular job. She was in a lot of movies in the 80s. Uh, the Big Chill. She's Canadian, She too. was also in Invasion of the Body Snatch. Yeah, she was born in B.C., or yeah. at least she was raised in B.C. before moving to L.A. So she did a spectacular job. It's got a good cast all around. And it's a good little creepy suspense story. And, uh, hell, you can pick it up in any $5 bin at a, at a you know, Walmart or something. So if you get a chance, I would recommend as something obscure, something you might not think about watching, Psycho Number 2. And well, you were meh on my pick as Constantine for a redemption or a second look. I think I'm a little bit meh on your thing of Psycho 2. <laughs> You're going to give me the meh? <laughs> yeah, I'm giving you a little meh on that one because, you know what, <laughs> following up a classic movie, not never mind horror, just a classic movie like Hitchcock's Psycho, I don't know where you could have taken it. And I've, I think I remember seeing it, and I've seen the movie, I think, exactly once. And my impression overall was, you know, like Psycho, except not nearly half as good. Uh, not nearly as good, but it's still a nice little uh, fun way to spend a Halloween evening. At least that's what I think. Well, yeah, you could bookend those two movies, I guess. And okay, Mike, now you're up. My pick of Halloween watching is the Jordan Peele's directoral debut of Get Out. Oh, a nice I safe pick, Mike. It was really good. One of two horror movies I've seen so far this season. Uh, the other one being a classic, and we'll get into that maybe next year. I don't know, but that's my pick for this one. You picked, I a, you picked a new release. A very, I, I well, think, yeah, I think it, what it he's a, sneakily trying to do is to elevate a really good movie into instant kind of classic movie status, which I'm willing, to, I'm willing to give it to you only on the strength that I've seen it a couple of times and it really does stand already up. It, does. it already does. So I think what you're doing is trying to elevate it right away, which is a little presumptive, but hey. I will grant you that I think it's a movie that will stand very strong in 10, 20, 30 years down the road. It just cool, does, cool. will stand up. No one said it had to have been a classic. I could have picked it No, a but I, I, I congratulate you. Yeah, you I think it is a right. little bit of a safe, a safe kind of pick, but I agree with it. Yeah. Hey, we can only say we were met about each other's pick. I think we're both in agreement. Say, yeah, if okay. you haven't already experienced the magic of that movie, check it out. And if you have seen I, it, I was enjoy it again. Year. I was mad last year. With yeah, my, last uh, year you picked uh, Final Destination. Final Destination. <laughs> I don't so, think you picked the first so, one. I think you picked number two or something like no, that. No, no, I, well, I, I picked one, but you showed all of them. I had mentioned that I watched yeah. five, which was just a blood splatter. But anyways, those are our three Halloween movie picks for the year. So if you're looking for something different, you get you certainly got different from this one. Yeah, take them for what they are. So there let's you go. Go on to the next segment here. Let's get on. Okay, so next up we got Mike, and he's got some beautiful, scary, creepy, silver and bronze age stuff for us tonight, Mike. Wow, very nice. Oh yeah, yeah, the House of Mystery number 155 from December of 1965. Now it's a lower grade, it's about a VG. Didn't pay much more than it's worth, paid about 11 and a quarter for it. Cover is Jack Sparling. This ran, this series ran from October 51 to all the way up to October of 83. It started off as horror, then they brought in um, superheroism, then they had the dial for H for hero stuff, and then they kind of went back to 
horror again, and they kind of flip flopped throughout this series. But House of Mystery is one of the big DC uh, horror titles, though it'll always be remembered as a horror title. Although you're right in saying that, like I said, they switch formats back and forth over the years, kind of to jazz it up, so to speak. Like this is a Martian Manhunter, who is obviously a DC uh, superhero. But I mean, that's a very kind of creepyish, kind of horror, kind of cover. I mean, you on the subway train and the doors open and you see a bunch of aliens, that's going to kind of scare the hell out of me. I don't know you. about yeah. you. <laughs> Although they're kind of funky looking, like they're wearing almost like carnival masks and they're going to the carnival or something like that. Yeah, it's something cool. where, but look at the shock on his face as they go, ah, so I kind of liked it just for that. Anyways, let's move on. What do you got under there, Mike? Got some more house action going on here. What do we got? Oh, another house. House of Secrets this time. House of Secrets. Secrets. And now we're starting to get into some nice stuff. Now, this is a much better cover. I think we know who this legend is. Neil The man, of course. November of 1969. Another long-running series. Again, the VG copy. Although this one looks kind of better on the eye than the other one, it I mean. It does, but if you go up close, it needs a pressing. But uh, yeah, but a pressing will take like a, will actually actually really improve the grade if they're not color break, man. Uh, I was something I would consider. You know, Sandy only charges ten bucks for a book. Uh, oh, there we go. Because I paid about eleven twenty-five U.S. It's worth about twenty twenty-five in a four point oh. So a pressing might probably bring that. Significantly value? up, uh, significantly. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and I just love the the stylization of the girl's face and the and the boy's face. Well, that's the best and aspect of the cover for me. The the two kids there with that dog looking over the the kids. I mean, the the only one noticing the uh, ghostly idiot there is the doggy. The kids are engrossed in whatever crap they're doing. The TV. Yeah, no. Uh. I mean, the man could do no wrong. I mean, this is a strong cover. I mean, I'm a Neil, big Neil fan. And I mean, okay, his Batman stuff is what I prefer. But I mean, looking at this cover, yeah, if I saw it for cheap like you did, I'd pick it up. There's a lot of collectors out there that all they do is collect Neil Adams work. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's one for you. Great Neil Adams cover, no doubt about it. Great books, Mike. Thanks for bringing them in. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Jose is definitely, definitely kicking it up a notch here at the old graveyard as we're uh, going to show two very significant Tomb of Dracula key. Would I be right to consider them keys? You would indeed. So if you kind of priced out out of the first appearance, and let's face it, you know, it's gone through the roof recently, what would you go for? Well, of course, you go for a second appearance, and you'd go for an origin issue, and this is exactly what I do right here. Nice. Tomb of Dracula, issue number 12, from September of 1973, is the second appearance of Blade, and the book will be featuring soon. Uh, right underneath it is Tomb of Dracula, issue 13, from October of 73. It's the third appearance and origin of Blade. So, one of the big news items from San Diego Comic Con 2019 has Blade returning to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Nice. Can I say get a hey yeah for that? Hell yeah. Yeah. Apparently they already have chosen the actor who ably played Cottonmouth in the really good Luke Cage series on Netflix. And of course I'm talking about the brilliant Mahershala Ali who was deadly as the poisonous snake in the series. An incredible actor with an Emmy and two Oscars to his credit. He knows how to play the bad guy. Yeah, the Blade character will be taken to a new level with this actor. Simply, in my opinion, a great choice. With Ali, there will be no crazy Wesley Snipes antics on or off the screen. <laughs> yeah. What are you trying to say there? Yeah, Wesley, he, he had his problems there, including not declaring all of his income and paying the tax man, which he paid big time for. Well, I want to say that simply, his solid acting and ability to portray both good and evil will make you believe it. He is, in my opinion, of course, the perfect fit for the part. Now, with this particular news, of course, everyone is dusting off their blade keys again. 
the hunt is officially on for Tomb of Dracula number 10 from <laughs> July of 73, Blade's fearsome first appearance. Blade, in my opinion, is probably the best character to come out of the Tomb of Dracula series. Mm -hmm. His second appearance was fighting with Dracula here with the aid of the Harkers in issue number 12. This issue was created by none other than Frank Bruner with Gene Colan and an incomparable script by none other than the Wolfman, Marv Wolfman. Yeah, Dracula in the issue is written historically in the comic book. The only, the way that only Marv Wolfman can do it. Now, on this very next issue, issue number 13, Eric Brooks Blade was born in London uh, back at the October of 1929. Nice. Yeah, his father was named Lucas Cross, and he happened to be a member of a secret society, the Order of Strana. Yeah, and he sent his pregnant wife over to England before he was taken prisoner in the country of Latveria. Yeah, there she took the name of Vanessa Brooks and found shelter with a brothel owner named, get this, Madame Vanity, who was another member of the Order of Tirana. Now, experiencing labor complications, she was forced to seek a doctor's assistance, but the doctor, Deacon Frost, was actually a ravenous vampire who feasted on the poor woman as she gave birth, passing on a series of enzymes that altered her baby. Now, these enzymes entered the infant's bloodstream and transformed them into a being tainted by a vampire's kiss, but not converted. In other words, half human, half vampire, also called a dampier. Yeah, Frost was driven away before he could slay the child, but Tara perished, leaving the orphaned Eric Brooks to be raised at Madame Vanity's brothel. Nice. Yes. Great so story. these are the two books. They both have excellent covers. Of course, my personal favorite is the origin issue because it has Blade right on the cover yeah. there. Nice. Yes. They are both hot books. Why do I do what I do? It's because of a comfort level. I am way, way priced out to a copy of his first appearance in the for grade sure. that I would be satisfied with. Yeah. In other words, if I was looking for something anywhere around the VF 8.0 grade, I'd be looking well in excess of $1,000 US Ow. out of my price range. Yeah, that's for so, sure. So, can you, do you want to go several rungs down on the ladder and get a grade that you would never really be satisfied with? Or do you go out and get a second appearance, an orange yeah, issue, and a really high grade or in a high grade that you'd be comfortable with? I'm of the second opinion that you go out there and you get yourself a 992 copy of these two books, which I think I just did. I will probably get them slapped. Yeah, and they are high grade, Jose. I was very impressed. I looked yeah. at them earlier. Yeah. Very impressive. And when you show the footage there, yeah, check out the spines and check out the corners. They're pretty, pretty nice and tight. Yeah. Yeah. So, let's finish it off. The 49th Over Street Price Breaks will take Tomb of Dracula, issue number 12, the second appearance first. The breaks are 54, 102, and 150 US in the 8, 99.2 grade splits. For Tomb of Dracula, issue number 13, the origin issue, the price breaks are 61, 123, and $185 US in the 8, 9, and 9.2 grade splits. Yeah, so uh, obviously they aren't aren't uh, cheap, but well worth the money. And um, for the money paid, I could probably not even have gotten a VG copy, oh. slabbed copy of oh, issue yeah. number ten. Guaranteed, guaranteed. So yeah, yeah. I mean, you do what you do. Moral of the story is: if you can't pick up the first appearance, go for an origin, go for a second appearance. Damn right, and buy the best grade that you can afford. Absolutely. Great books, Jose. Thanks for bringing them in. Big hoy hoy on that one.
Okay, and uh, for Mike's last segment of the evening, he's brought into some really, some two really nice Bronze Age beauties here. And we're going to start with the House of Secrets. Is that right, Mike? Oh, yeah. From November 1970, Neil Adams cover once again. Both the cover and interior apparently all painted. Wow. How could you not pass something up like that for 11 to Double wow. I am speechless, man. That is one fantastic, haunting, and beautiful cover, Mike. I really, two thumbs up on this Neil book, man. And they said, oh, it's almost like an homage to some of the Batmans and the other ones. Oh, man, that is one cool cover. Enough said. Had to grab it. Had to. On cover appeal alone, I guess, again, the, the dudes are in consensus. This is a great pickup. And it's Toronto Comic Book Show. Especially yeah. for that price, man. That is a great pickup, Mike. Oh, so can you top that with the book underneath? Uh, just a little bit because we got a number one. Nice. No, Secrets of Haunted House. Haunted House. And you know, I've shown a few of these in the past. Uh, I've shown a number five, Bernie Wrightson cover, which mm -hmm. is pretty hard to get, but this is May 1975, first issue, and I only paid, believe this or not, I got this from, and I have to give him a shout out. Of course, you're going to say, Bat the Cave. Batcave, I recognize that book, man, you you snagged this one, I, I was tempted, and you, you pulled the trigger on it. I in my pocket, and I said, okay, just take, here's a 10, and here's a whole bunch of change, <laughs> in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> I basically got it for 11 or 12 bucks Canadian. Yeah, yeah. Worked out to about eight and a quarter US. The <laughs> Shout out. Chandra. I love the kids. Again, kids frightened as hell. Uh, creepy looking. Monster. A and lighthouse and in the background. Lighthouse in the background. Just Fantastic. Like yeah. Classic cover. Oh, wow. Thumbs well, up you again. Can, you can ask for a better cover for a Halloween episode, that's for sure. Oh, I love it. And a number one issue, DC, from what, the, the late 70s there? Uh, yeah, mid-70s. Yeah, I 75. mean, mid-high grade. Um, yeah, absolutely spectacular, Mike. I'm jealous. Uh, and you can't go wrong buying a number one issue, let's face it, especially back then when number ones actually meant something. Oh, absolutely. Those are great books, Mike. Thanks for bringing them in. Yeah, on my side, verdict, very jealous. Boom! So Jose bringing it home tonight, and honestly, I can't think of any better way to bring home an episode than two Golden Age books, which is exactly what we're going to show. And what you're about to show are two of the most spectacular horror books we've ever shown on any of our Halloween episode. So Jose, man, take it away. Show this is spect. I'm very excited about what we're about to see here. <laughs> just a little tongue tied, eh? <laughs> Yeah, so before we get into the details here, I just thought I'd give a couple of thoughts here about some recent news. So the pre-code horror market, I think, just lost its mind when in mid-September of this year, a CGC 3.0 copy, a good, very good copy of Mask, issue number one, sold in a live auction on Comic Connect for, get this, drum roll please, 11000 Four hundred and twenty-two dollars U.S. Wow. Now, I checked after the auction was over, and there are about fifty slab copies of this book in the census. I know this has always been a major pre-code horror key, but this auction result is truly astonishing to me. Earlier this year, a CGC 6.0 fine copy sold for around thirteen k U.S. Now. The holder of the highest graded copy commented on the auction results on Instagram with as follows, quote, glad I bought this book before people lost their minds. It's a great book, 
but it's not that great, unquote. Now, personally, whether you think it's that great or not, to me, there's no denying that this is truly an unbelievable result for this book in that grade. Now, this re result, of course, can be daunting for those collectors new or unfamiliar with the ins and outs of the pre-code horror marketplace. Now, I'll be upfront, I'm no expert, but I'm here to tell our viewers that you don't have to spend an arm and a leg to snag some truly collectible pre-code horror titles if you're willing to dig and do some homework to educate yourself. For sure. The two pre-code horror titles I'll be featuring in this segment are case in point. Bottom line, I think you'd rather than spend a few hundred bucks on a high ratio incentive variant that may or may not be dead spec in a few months, I think the wiser move is to go for the old pre-cold gold. I really don't think you'll regret it. If you're new to the golden age, I strongly recommend that you get any trusted guidance you can and take your time to do research before buying. Now, without further delay, on to the two books. First up, we have Chamber of Chills, issue number 15 from January 1953. Harvey Comics, cover artist Lee Elias. Chamber of Chills, for those not in the know, was a horror anthology comic published bi-monthly by Harvey Publications in the early 1950s, and it ran for a total of 26 issues from June 1951 to December 1954. Issue 7 of the title is mentioned in Dr. Frederick Wortham's scathing indictment of comic books, Seduction of the Innocent. The title sees publication following the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency Hearings of 1954. Harvey then began concentrating on titles for young children like Little Dot and Richie Rich. Now, it should be noted that about half of the issues in the run contain bondage, torture, sadism, perversion, gore, cannibalism, eyes being ripped out, decapitation and severed heads, acids in the face, etc., etc. All the good things a growing young adolescent boy and 50s America, very complex society, needed to kind of engage his imagination. <laughs> One of the all-time pre-code horror covers is issue 23 from this run featuring, get this, a corpse with a mouthful of maggots about to kiss a woman. Yeah, mm. having laid out all of that lurid content, my cover, it seems to me, seems rather tame in comparison, which in a way helps explain the somewhat modest price pays for this book. The general rule of thumb in regards to PCH covers is the gorier, the better value-wise. Nevertheless, I'm pretty chuffed to have picked up a decent VG, VG minus copy of an issue from a historic and notorious title. The point I want viewers to understand is that while EC Comics may be the gold standard of the pre-code horror market, there are many and varied publishers out there with nuggets to be mined by the savvy and knowledgeable collector. The 49th Overstreet price breaks for this book are 78, 117, 231, 378, and 525 dollars US in the 4, 6, 8, 9, and 9.2 grade splits. Now, our final book of the evening, ah, my favorite, Tales of Terror, issue number one from 1952, Toby Press, Gene Fawcett, cover art. Now, again, for those not in the know, Toby Press was a small but respectable comic book publisher in business from 1949 to 1955. The company published reprints of Al Cap's Little Abner comic strip and licensed character comics starring such film and animated cartoon properties such as John Wayne and Felix the Cat. They also published original conceptions including romance, war, western, and adventure comics. Toby Press 
also used an imprint titled Minorn, under which they put out this one and only issue of Tales of Terror. Then they got hit by a cease and desist order from EC Comics, which used that title for EC's Tales of Terror annuals. Toby dropped the title and started over with Tales of Horror, which ran for a total of 13 issues. Now, our pal Uncle Sandy from Retro Air surprised me with this copy and quoted me the very, very reasonable price of $250 Canadian. The book has really good eye appeal. It's about a VG, VG plus in grade 4, 4, 5, and it will definitely be submitted for slabbing. I, I went online and checked, and uh, the latest sale, a CTC graded 4.5 copy sold through Heritage Auctions in the last calendar year for about $450 US. And finally, let's get down to the Overstreet. The 49th Overstreet price breaks for this book are 106, 159, 334, 567, and $800 US in the four, six, eight, nine, and 9.2 great splits. Wow. Wow, Jose, those are absolutely spectacular. Um, yeah, and I, I've never seen horror books like this from the golden age on, on, uh, on our show before and uh i mean i was here with you at sandy's when you picked up this first one and uh, we were both excited about seeing it not just about the age of it but also the condition which this is, is very a nice. very good looking 445 yeah. he was a little surprised he asked me to grade it and i was a little too conservative i told him 354 on yeah. close inspection since i've bought it i would say it's definitely i think a four five and i will get it pressed uh, mm -hmm. assuming that he hasn't already pressed it which i don't believe he has and how the pages look on the inside. The yeah. pages are decent, they're cream, but yeah. they're like solid. There's no brittleness to them, which yeah. is the main thing. Oh, that's the big thing, yeah. Yeah, that is spectacular. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm <laughs> super jealous. I need to pick up at least one of these books at some point. Hopefully by next Halloween, I'll have something like this, something really special. Hopefully at the next Toronto Comic Book Show, I'll pick something up. And of course, we've got the Hamilton Comic Con coming up in uh, a couple weeks. Perhaps I can pick something up there as well. You never know. We're going to be busy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyways, guys, I hope you like that. That's uh, obviously a very different type of episode than we normally show. All horror books. Not a lot of superhero stuff. But uh, hope you like it. Something different once a year. And again, anytime uh, Halloween comes around, we love doing this. It's our favorite time of the year. And um, yeah, um, what I'm going to do as we uh, we close the night off i'm going to show you some footage from the spirit halloween store here in, in mississauga sorry in etobicoke uh each year they open up a halloween the super big super store for halloween you know lots of costumes creepy props and stuff and i had the opportunity to go there last week and and shoot some footage and i think i did the same thing last year so i hope you like it and i hope you have a very scary very creepy halloween and we will see you next year. And uh, once again, if you like what you saw, leave the comments because we love reading them and we will always respond. And uh, see you next time. Hoy hoy. Yes, guys. Special guest Mike. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Human flesh to feed that evil. The more 